<clears throat> yeah, I, I think I'm going to wait another couple of years. Yeah, I long COVID scares the shit out of me. Yeah, you see what's happening with Physics Girl. There's a lot of other people yeah. I own who've gotten long COVID. Yeah, we, we have two people on our CosmoQuest team. Both Annie and Allie have long COVID. Mm -hmm. And I, my health don't isn't great to begin with. Yeah, don't want it. So you haven't had COVID yet. Nope. Yeah, the two of us are going to be like the last human standing other than my husband. <laughs> so. Yeah, so Carla hasn't had COVID either. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're going to be the last four standing. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so did you watch the, did you try to watch the launch this morning? I did. I did. And, and like having read what Musk posted last night, um, about how don't expect it to launch tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I like fully expected them to have a reason to not launch today. And but, sure but enough, I mean, like SLS didn't launch on the oh, first yeah, yeah. go. Yeah. This is a, this is a big rocket. The, the, the biggest ever built. It's going to go wrong in a thousand different ways. And yeah. their job is to troubleshoot each one of those ways bit mm -hmm. by bit until things stop going wrong and it just starts flying. Um, I'm just so, sad because yeah. today was the best weather of the week. Yeah, it was really nice weather. I mean, yeah. the weather down at, at Boca Chica was just flawless. The weather, the wind was low. The, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. It would have been just great to watch it launch. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, I, uh, I mean, just it's it was funny because I was watching early for a bunch you. Of, well, it was. So I did. I woke up at like three and then sort of oh. checked whether or not it had been scrubbed yet, and it was still ongoing. So I set my alarm for five forty-five, and then I got up at five forty-five. And I had about 30 minutes before it was supposed to launch. And then I got up, got some coffee. And then it was like, oh, we've got a, we're going to have to scrub the launch, but we'll count down to one minute before. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but no, I, I it's funny because I, I was watching um, Tim Dodd's, you know, Everyday Astronauts yeah. channel. And at one point he, he posted to the, to his chat saying like, you know, give me your, like, what do you think are the odds that it's going to launch? And what do you think the odds are that it's going to complete its mission, its mm -hmm. milestones? And people are like, you know, uh, hundred, hundred percent, you know, I was like, folks never watched a rocket launch yeah. for the first time before. Like I give it a 10% chance of launching on the first try. I, I think like, I, I will predict we're going to see two weeks of scrubs at least. That's my guess. I Two can weeks see that. Yeah, yeah, just like and just like and not even because they're mission critical. Things. Like just anything mm. that makes you like a little bit nervous, just stop the count. Wait a day. And they're going to have boat problems. Like Cape Canaveral has never mm. had boat problems. Yeah, they, they are in a very active shipping area that is not used to launches. So it's perfectly fine to just err on the side of caution mm -hmm. and just wait and see what happens. Uh, uh, you know, anything makes you a little nervous, stop the countdown, yeah. shift a day. Uh, and then I give it a 30% chance. I mean, this is <laughs> now I'm just, you know, pulling numbers out of my butt, but, but like the super heavy has never been tested before. Uh huh. <laughs> like, like there. This, they're skipping a whole bunch of tests because uh -huh. they've essentially used Falcon 9 training to teach a super heavy how to do its job. You know, but you're heavier. Just, yep. just keep that in mind. You know, <laughs> hey, computer, <laughs> the show, just, you know, modify the math to remember that you're heavier, superly heavier. Uh, and, yeah. and it's one of these things where it's so easy to forget that size and mass aren't linearly related if you double something's length you're gonna have to cube its mass in general mm -hmm. yeah. um yeah yeah so how mckinney's saying now i have to torture myself more about should i drive down for the next attempt from houston 
Texas area? Yes, you should That's drive one down. Like heck of an ugly drive. Yeah, but you miss one hundred percent of the rocket launches that you don't go to see. So, yeah, you could drive down. Could be scrubbed. You're gonna have to, and then maybe you're gonna stay in a hotel for a couple of days, and then it'll be scrubbed again, and then you'll drive home, and then a week later they'll tell you that it's launching. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, this is your life. Like you, like if you want to get the launch of Starship into your eye holes. Um, you're going to have to make this six hour drive each way, each time. This is your life now. I I remember when Nancy Atkinson went down and stayed for, I mean, it felt like it was a few months in Florida mm -hmm. to catch a bunch of launches and do a ton of interviews. And it's just sort of like, that's the way you do it. You, you rent a house, you, right. you yeah. just stay, you commit to just staying put. J just during the housing crisis back in 2007, yeah. I was like really tempted to buy a condo at Cape Canaveral. Yeah. Because they were so cheap. <laughs> they were yeah. so cheap. Like you could buy a, a condo for $75,000. $75, oh, geez. Yeah. And now they're whatever. Again, back up to 300000 plus. Yeah. So, you know, just to have this condo, rent it out, but then also have a place that – that the team can go and, and watch launches. So, you know, who knows next time, next time there's a giant housing crash and property is really <laughs> cheap. I will, uh, I'll see about, about grabbing some. That works. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this has been saying low energy today. This is how people move to Florida. They want to see a launch and then they just never leave. Gordon Dewis's property law in Florida is insane. Gordon, you're Canadian. Like Canadians live in Florida all the time. It's true. Yeah, like it's half Canadian. Like it's only insane for non-Canadians, I suspect. Canadians have you know, clearly something's being done for them. All right, let's uh, let's begin. All right. So episode six seventy eight. I am pressing can record. Confirm. I am pressing the other record. I have also pressed record. And we are recording. Astronomy Cast, episode 678, World Building, Planet Formation Growth. I suddenly can't hear you. I think this is my headphones just died spontaneously. I shocked them because I'm wearing a wool sweater. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recordings. I'm going to switch to external speakers and then go find headphones. Um. Can you, you say me? something? Yeah. yeah, so it's my headphones just bit the dust. I will be right back. No, it's not your headphones. It's something on my side. Oh, really? But I just switched to external speakers. But it was on my side that it went off. Oh, they couldn't hear you either. Okay, so it wasn't me. Yeah, and it can hear me faintly now. All right. Um, Weird. Okay, let me. Yeah, I can hear you. Now in my it says headphone. I'm very quiet. Yeah, you are, but that I can at least help with. And I have an echo. So did you change the? The oh, the echo was I had you coming outside of my my external. I had you coming out my external speakers because the timing of it was I shocked my headset and then you yeah. went away. So so. Audacity complained that something was competing for my audio device. So I, I'm i going to think Discord has been doing stuff like this. Yeah, Discord, Discord is an asshole with audio devices. Yeah, so I'm going to close Discord and maybe some other things as well. Okay, Discord is out. Who else gets to be out? Zoom? Zoom gets to be out. Okay. 
Well, you may have to leave and come back. Uh, Usually, I have to reboot after Discord does its thing. No, can you hear me or am I? I can hear you, but you're still soft. Okay, hold on. Wonder. Th so Lenovo Vantage can't have access to my microphone. Either or feedback hub. I don't want to listen to or Xbox or Xbox Game Bar. So okay. Who tried to go after my microphone? Just Chrome, just you. Yeah. And a so let me close. I'm good now. Okay, so switch to yeah. tap the mic you think you're on. Or I think I've had like I've been doing some recordings with uh you know for some of my other stuff and I've got somebody in Discord and it messes up or even yeah. the video goes off. So I think I think we're okay now. Okay. I am going to restart and restart. Okay, I am now recording yet again. I am also now recording yet again. Okay. Astronomy Cast, episode 678, world building, planet formation, growth, and ejection. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, the publisher of Universe Today. With me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I, I am doing well, but sleepy like you and not even quite as extreme as you. Uh, we got up to attempt to watch a giant rocket yeah. go up and hopefully come back down and it it did not but we we are still paying the sleep penalty for it so we've like even though the weather is just horrible here we've been getting uh, a lot of really interesting wildlife things the swallows just showed up oh, for, wow. the, for the first time this year um the daffodils have opened up for the first time this year where i live um and sandhill cranes. So I'm on the flight path for sandhill cranes that go from their summer to their winter homes. And it's just amazing. Like you hear them when they're over the horizon and then you go outside and you wait and then and then it's just this giant formation of sandhill cranes that <sighs> fly overhead, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Giant birds, like as big as anything any other bird that you'll ever see and like think like pink flamingo size like they're big yeah um, yeah and they they fly overhead and they make this great sound and we have these ponds and like a little marshy area you know i'm out there and i'm like waving to them come on down here like spend a night like i will i will offer you great facilities but they just keep flying overhead so oh. so, so far we have yet to convince a, uh, a a wing of sandhill cranes to come and land on our property and, and enjoy a, a, an evening on our palatial estate. Ah, oh, that would be amazing. It would really be amazing. Yeah, yeah, I'm really excited. Hopefully, and apparently around here they do. So so various places they'll stop for the night, and it's just like cacophony. It just sounds wonderful. Ah, oh, that's yeah. That's we just have like barred owls being very loud this time of year yeah. Yeah. and uh, they sound like monkeys and it's really disturbing to wake up at two in the morning to what sounds like monkeys going between the trees but it's just the owls yep all right sci-fi writers today we're going to give you a guided tour of building planets how they form how they grow and how things can go horribly horribly wrong and we'll talk about it in a second but it's time for a break and we're back. All right. Uh, so how, how do you want to approach this? I mean, we've got, how do you get, this is how you get planets, <laughs> I guess. 
How do you get planets? Well, when when a large enough uh, stellar nebula gets knocked by a shock wave of some kind, it might collapse. And while collapsing, sometimes, if you're very lucky, you can end up with a blob of matter globbing on gravitationally to other blobs of matter until they form a planet. All right. That's too simplified. I know. Give Use some more complicated words. Like I, I get the analogy that you're, you're trying to run with here. Um, when a mommy plant loves, anyway. Um, how, so like, what is the, I mean, how do we get these planets? So, so basically when, when you have a star forming, you have a cloud that is majority hydrogen helium. And then in addition to that are going to be heavier elements in a variety of different proportions, depending on how many different supernovae and other things like stellar mass loss through solar winds have occurred in that vicinity. So like how polluted your yeah. stellar nebula is by previous generations of stars. Exactly. And if you have those heavier materials, as everything comes in, it, angular momentum is is the great deterrent of so many things in this universe as the material tries to fall in towards that forming star it ends up forming a disk and within that disk you have the potential for these atoms to form molecules to uh, form dust grains for dust grains to then collide together and through electrostatic forces begin to build larger and larger things until they start to get big enough that gravitationally they start pulling in mm. the material around them. Well, so I'll stop on that for one for one second, sorry. Yeah. So, I mean, and this was something that always sort of confused me was that you, if you have these little pieces of dust, yeah, they're so small and have so little gravity that they're not going to cling to each other gravitationally right. when the interactions and perturbations from the rest of the solar system are just going to keep tearing them apart and i'm assuming this was a mystery in astronomy for the longest time too i i don't know how long it was a mystery i have to admit that's that's one of those things that i don't know the history of but mm -hmm. as professors all deal with chalk dust we are all fully aware that when you you erase that chalkboard you get this fine particulate of dust just about everywhere but in the chalk tray beneath the chalk board, you can end up with growing globs of Whoa. chalky grossness. Really? And, and this is usually because humidity in the air, someone spills something, and you get chemical reactions. And these chemical reactions can allow the chalk, chalk in the chalk dust tray, it's not gravitationally holding itself together. It's chemically holding itself mm -hmm. together. And, and so once you've seen that, it's easy to go from, hmm, well, if dust in my classroom is capable of growing over time through the interplay of room conditions and dust, um, it's easy to imagine that in the universe itself, you have things chemically coming together and growing as well. Mm -hmm. But what you said is that it's electrostatically coming together. And if you think about it, if you have two charged particles, they come together. Or if you have two particles where one, I guess electrostatically is the wrong word, El electromechanics, electrochemical. If you have two atoms that have energy shells for their electrons that allow them to share electrons back and forth you can get molecules forming you can get these molecules then glomming on to other molecules this is where i prove i'm truly an astronomer who understands hydrogen helium and everything else is a metal right. but you can get these molecules binding together through either charges or chemical reactions to form larger and larger things. And eventually this is, this is how you start getting blobs that get big enough 
to gravitationally glom onto one another. And I just like the word glom. Right. Yeah, that, that is the scientific term is glomming. Yes. Uh, so you get these little planet nuggets. Yes. Um, Planetesimals. How, like, planetesimals. Like how big are these things before other forces start to take over? Like gravity. <sighs> Like, are they asteroid sized? Are they pebble sized? Are they sort of matching together, breaking each other up? Well, and, and the reason I'm staring off into the distance is we now know that you have objects like Bennu and Ryugu that are gravitationally held together, but are made of shattered minerals. Mm -hmm. And so you have this situation where you have things coming together loosely and they have to get big enough that they gravitationally crush themselves into minerals before you can really start having anything more than fluffy dust balls in space, which is rather unsatisfying. Exactly what size that's going to happen is going to depend on are they truly fluffy or are we looking at ice crystals growing? Mm. What is the composition? Things further away from that baby star where you're going to get a lot more ice production are going to start forming solid objects that are interesting at smaller sizes than uh, where you're dealing with more of that fluffy dust. All right, we're going to talk about this some more, but it's time for another break. And we're back. So we've got these fluffy dust particles. Yes ice crystals forming things are becoming larger and larger uh what happens next as as they get larger and larger they start to go from sticking together because they literally stuck together like two snowballs colliding to they start to be able to gravitationally pull material toward them out of the surrounding cloud and have you seen that picture of some of the shepherd moons orbiting Saturn? Yes. And you can see this. These things aren't big. They're like a kilometer across. But you can see this little spirally winding trail of yeah. material that's coming from the ring being distorted by this moon and then returning to the ring on the other side. It's super Leaving cool. these little weight. It's beautiful. Yeah. And it's just this tiny little thing, these tiny little shepherd moons. You could see the gravitational influence, even just from them, give that process millions of years. You see what happens. And and in this case, in instead of looking at these pictures of Saturn's ring systems, start looking instead at the Atacama Large Millimeter Array images that we have of the planetary disks uh, protoplanetary disks around young stars and you can start to see the gaps in the disk that are created in the places where planets are starting to come into existence and and now instead of having so much a a shepherd moon you have a a hungry planet eating <laughs> out that material and it's kind of awesome yeah um so now guess the larger dynamics of the solar system start to to take over because these things are now clearing out their orbits so what happens next now you start to get into this competition of who can grow fastest and keep the most material and it's also a battle against the light from the star at this point so you have two different processes going on. You have the planets gravitationally trying to grab the material within their sphere of influence, which they carry around with them as they orbit and orbit and orbit. You have the light pressure and the solar wind coming off of the young star then that is also blasting material outwards. So you have the planets trying to grab material from their surroundings at the same time that you have the star lighting up and trying to blast the material out of its surroundings. And this leads to 
We thought initially a model where you would consistently get rocky worlds forming right next to their parent planet, and you'd end up with gas giants in the outer solar system. And right now, we're not actually sure where and how things form. Mm. We just know that they do. Right. And... Once they form, we start having these weird gravitational puzzles work out as the worlds don't start out necessarily in stable orbits. They're just forming and grabbing whatever they can gravitationally. And this includes grabbing onto each other gravitationally. And you can end up with the worlds flinging each other into new orbits. And in our own solar system, we think at one point we ended up with Jupiter and Saturn in a resonance so that they were going around in an integer number so that they could both end up on one side of the sun at the same time. Mm. And by repeatedly adding their gravities together, they were able to rearrange the other objects in our solar system, including flinging Uranus and Neptune out to much greater distances from where they probably formed. And and we've done a whole episode on planetary migration, but yeah. this idea that that all of the large planets started out a lot closer to the sun and, and through their interactions between their gravity, they all shifted outward and hurled Uranus and Neptune even farther. Yeah. And Uranus and Neptune switched places. Yeah, yeah, it's wild. And and now as we look out at other uh, solar systems, we're seeing that there are gas giants snuggled up next to their stars, losing their atmospheres. And given the fullness of time, these could become little tiny rocky worlds that are in reality nothing more than the core of a former ice giant or gas giant. And so we can't necessarily know, because we don't know where planets initially started in our solar system, just how big an atmosphere different worlds had. What was their original state compared to what they are now? And and that is one of those things that I find fabulously intriguing. Now, we know that things changed quickly. So what whatever was, was over within probably half a billion years. Um, but that that period of complete chaos continued for for a period of time as everything rearranged. We just. Yep don't fully like, understand how it started. Like when we're talking about this period of mayhem, like we're even beyond earlier than the late heavy bombardment. Yes. Like there aren't even rocky surfaces yet. Just yeah. got planetoids crashing into planet. Like you just imagine yeah. like there would be dozens of planetoids all attempting to clear out their orbits, attempting to accrete material. They're, they're, interacting with one another gravitationally three orbits later they crash into each other they form a bigger object that object pulls in other objects like there must have just been mayhem and, and only yeah. when most of it had cleared out did you then get the time when asteroid strikes could happen all over the rocky planets and we don't fully know how many worlds there were what wow. we do know is Earth was struck by something the size of Mars and ended mm -hmm. up forming the Earth-Moon system. We know that Jupiter was struck by something big enough to make its core fluffy. We know that Uranus somehow got knocked over onto its side. Venus somehow got flipped over so that right. it it is just wrong in every kinematic way of looking at it. There were other worlds than these. And... We ate some of them. Some of them left our right. solar system. Some probably dove into the sun. <laughs> right. It's just wild. All right. We're going to talk about this some more, but it's time for another break. And we're back. So, like, thanks to the revolution of these large radio telescopes like ALMA, right? The large Atacama. The Atacama array. Large Millimeter and Submillimeter yeah, yeah. Array. Yeah. That we're seeing other star systems that are forming 
what clues are we getting? I mean, are we seeing them in those times when these things are crashing into each other and and making a mess? So, no, because what we're seeing is the dusty disk where planetesimals are just starting to coalesce out of the disk. The period of, of great chaos would have come after the disk had mostly been used up and blasted away by that central star. So we're seeing the earlier periods in time. Mm. But it's still cool because it gives us this sense of just how big solar systems are when they're first forming. I mean, I know that we have seen a couple of examples of planets that recently collided. Yes, but but that's different from seeing the full on complete chaos phase. Mm -hmm. That that but I is mean, from our perspective as human beings who only live say 100 years at the most. Fair. This fair. this period is hundreds of thousands of years long, millions of years long. It it's thought that the initial stage is probably in, measured in the hundreds of thousands and then the settling down into orbits is in the tens of millions. Right. And so we wouldn't see this bonkers um, planetary collision happening nonstop. We would see the, and I guess, as you said, right, like, like when you've got this giant star system that's forming with tons of dust, it's the perfect wavelength, wavelength for Alma yeah. to observe this incredible dust structure but after the star has ignited blown away all of that dust and now you're just left with a zillion planetoids yeah they're not easy to spot and no. so we only do see them when they collide with each other and you get this this puff of dust created from the shrapnel from one of these collisions and i know like like i said we've reported on several of these on universe today yeah that are happening in those first tens of millions of years now you mentioned though, like some go into the star, some get ejected out. So let's talk about some of the, like, what are the forces that are going to push those planets out of their star system? It's th three body interactions are the worst, man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just that simple. So you, you end up with, for instance, that situation of Jupiter and Saturn and then they can just keep pumping energy into the things around them and either fling them inwards or fling them outwards. And this dichotomy of options means sun or leave the solar system. And, and then you also have, There, there are, we, we haven't seen them yet. And it's pauses. Every time I say the sentence, we haven't seen them yet. You have read some paper that I haven't yet spotted. You're just waiting for me to tell you where we've seen this, <laughs> exactly. this thing that you're about to describe. Okay, yeah. okay I'm ready. I'm ready. So, so there, there is that potential for there to be a double planet system that manages to grab onto a third planet and fling it outwards. So you can imagine we have the pluto Charon system and then Haimea gets a little too close and gravitationally gets flung away. I do not know of any examples of rogue planets on escape trajectories where we can trace where they came from. No. So, so we have... Yeah. We have seen rogue planets, but they yes. have been of the gas giant variety where it is probably this energy pumping of, of that things getting into synchronization and the resonance just flings things away. And we're detecting it through methods like uh, gravitational microlensing, right. the method for finding these rogue planets. And I don't think you get a lot of really good information about the velocity of the planet and no. maybe what its origins were. It but sounds like a big ask for us to be able to see that kind of thing. I want to say there was a, a planet on its way away from its star that was spotted by the Hubble Space Telescope in the early 2000s or the late 90s, hmm. where it was one of those, is it a gas giant or a brown dwarf? Right. Yeah, but I mean, there have definitely it's... been some brown dwarfs seen 
high velocities moving through the interstellar medium. Yeah. Um, so then, I mean, one of the theories right now is that there are as many rogue planets in the Milky Way as there are stars. Yeah. So is it then just gen generally believed that each solar system kicks out at least one big planet? So have it would have to be more than that, because if you mm -hmm. think about it, not all of the stars have planets because you have the low metallicity ones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Stars in general uh, are quite often found in multiples. So you're looking at systems that have planets are likely to evict more than one planet mm -hmm. on average. Yeah. And that's and, just and the kind most of extreme... amazing to think about. Yeah, I mean, the most extreme estimate that I had heard for that was that there could be like 10 planets for every star, rogue planets, 10 rogue planets for every star out there. And that, we're... go ahead. Oh, because there are so many of those three body interactions that kick out material that there's just mountains of it out there drifting through the cosmos. And And where we really struggle is we have the capacity through gravitational lensing to see foreground high mass objects, gravitationally lens background stars. And these are often uh, dramatic enough to draw our attention such that we also see when a planet uh, that is orbiting that star also micro lenses that star. But we aren't seeing just random blips of light from planets microlensing things left and right. And right. those are going to be lost in a lot of the noise, unfortunately. So, I mean, we're going to, it's going to give us eventually, like the machine that's really going to do this is the Nancy Grace Roman telescope. It's yes. going to be looking for microlensing at the largest scale. It's going to be watching huge chunks of the sky, watching the brightness of the stars, checking to see if any any of them dim yeah. and we should get an upper boundary on the number of planets that are out there even a sense of how many rogue black holes there are zipping around the yes. cosmos uh so nancy Grace roman can't come soon soon enough it's true and honestly lsst as well because it's it's going to be able to spot more of the these background stars getting lensed as well with its constant night after night cadence and all of the software that's being developed to specifically look for anything that changes in brightness. So yeah, I mean, it's like a, a different, I mean, it's at a different time scale. Like, yeah, your Rubin yeah. is going to be taking a picture and then coming back three days later and noting the supernova that went off. Right. While Nancy Chris Roman will be watching a field of view, slicing it up in time and noting for any variations in brightness of any of the objects in that field of view. So they're just, they're kind of two different ways to, to approach this, hopefully overlapping, but yes. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's kind of amazing the, how you just go from gas dust and the corpses of other stars into the desiccated corpses of other stars into new planets, chaos. new life and chaos. Yeah. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you, Fraser, and thank you, everyone out there who supports the show. And as a reminder, our patrons get ad-free versions of every episode through Patreon. No so, ads. No ads. It just sounds so civilized. It really, really does. So if you don't want to hear me reading ads, join our Patreon. This week, I would like to uh, thank a s subset of our donors, and you can find out how much you have to give to hear me mispronounce your name over on patreon.com slash astronomycast. I really don't mean to mispronounce your names, but here goes. I'm going to try right. one more time. Uh, this week, I would like to thank Kenneth Ryan, Benjamin Mueller, Paul D. Disney, Omar Del Riviera, uh, Janelle, Matt Rucker, Iran Zegev, uh, Michelle Cullen, Peter, Scott Briggs, Mark H. Wittick, Mark Stephen Raznak, Philip Grand, Bruce Amazine, Don Mundus, Abraham Cattell, Jim McGeehan, 
uh, Anator, Ant Asor, Michael Regan, Dean McDaniel, Ninja Nick, J. Alex Anderson, Father Prax, Schmiersum, Frodo Tenenbaugh, uh, James Ruger, Roger uh, Dwight Ilk, and Paul L. Hayden. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week. All and right. And then they saved. Six, okay. seven, eight. Yes. Thank you, Ash Ruber. Thank you. So I'm going to ask the chat. Chat, would you attend a giant science fiction convention now in the current state of COVID? Have you seen what's going on in India right now? No. There's, um, they're having the largest peak they've so far had during COVID. Oh. Uh, it's the new XB1.16 uh, variant that is just starting to make it into the U.S. and Canada. Um, this particular variant has uh, some significant changes to not just the spike protein, but one of the other proteins. And they're finding that it's escaping the vaccines and past uh, hmm. uh, immunity from past infection. Um, yeah. 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 All right, go ahead and ask some questions. So Gordon Lewis and Hal McKinney have gotten into a big conversation about uh, the Jupiter's prime meridian. So how do, we, how do we determine where Jupiter's prime meridian is since we can't see physical features on its surface? Which is like one step more complicated than how do we measure the day length on Jupiter? I, I honestly don't think that we really have it defined because the way we define prime meridian is usually off of a stationary thing mm -hmm. and and so that would require there to be a stationary thing we, we measure its rotational period using its magnetic field and other effects um yeah not entirely sure so there is a paper here where they define the prime meridian uh, based on the magnetic field on, okay. from Juno. Uh, the x-axis defined by zero degrees latitude on the system three longitude prime meridian. So... The spin period was originally based on ground-based radio observations, and the longitude was defined to increase with time as observed from Earth. But then they used Juno observations. So I'll, I'll, I'll put the, the paper in the chat, and then okay. you can dig into it, Gordon. So my guess is that, you know, like I know like, like sad, like reported that they've only just recently figured out the the prime meridian on or or sorry the day length on Saturn yeah yeah Saturn like was been, really hard to figure out yeah it's been really tricky to figure out how long a day is on Saturn um I think with Jupiter it's easier just because it's such a powerful magnetic field um I don't see any other questions so that means we we rant, rant doesn't it yeah yeah it does unless you see anything over on twitch then we rant i i'm not so back to ai <laughs> um, <laughs> so so I, have you been have you seen this rise of this thing called auto gpt no so so what someone did was they took a one large language model and they gave it the ability to store long term memory, short term memory, be able to do web queries, be able to use external APIs, be able to write its own code, be able to do kind of anything that you would want, like all the stuff that you can't do in, in yeah. GPT 4. 
And then what they do is that you just you give a goal um, and then you set it loose and it can then it'll then reinstantiate itself, attempting to achieve this goal, saving files on your um, saving files on your computer. It will spin up iterations of GPT 3.5 if you have access to the API where it can it can send queries over to that and receive the data back and then act on that. And it's it's worthless. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, like I installed it, you know, like people have been playing around with it and they're all obsessed, you know, the, the hustle, the hustle bros are obsessed with it. And I've, I've been playing around with it and it's, it's just, it's a hot mess. It didn't get anything done. It just stumbled around doing stupid things. So, so have you read the, the book, um, the moon is a harsh mistress by mm -hmm, Robert mm -hmm. Heinlein. Mm -hmm. I went back and I'm rereading it over on my Twitch stream and I had forgotten all the little details in it that that now seem to be like the direction we're inching in, mm. where you have this computer that is set loose to figure out the best ways to implement this, the best way mm -hmm. to implement that, and you just keep adding to it and adding to it. And eventually, all of the algorithms become sentient. Right. And one of the things that keeps coming up that I really love is for a computer, you either remember it or you don't. So you can ask Mike or Michelle, the name of the AI, the AI to erase things you wish it didn't know about. And it will. And it no longer remembers them at all. It's like gone, gone. Right. And, and I just love this concept of oh, I wish it didn't have that input. Delete that input and see what happens now. Well, I mean, you get that a bit when you do a new query in ChatGPT. It starts from scratch and yeah. then you then you teach a bunch of information. And as soon as you start a new query, it doesn't remember any of that before. So so it's auto GPT. So someone has created a version they call Chaos GPT. <laughs> and Chaos GPT's goal, and it's been running continuously, and its goal is to destroy humanity. And so is just like ranting <laughs> nonstop. And so it does things like it does searches on Google to try and find out the, the best ways to wipe out humanity. And it finds a bunch of really powerful weapons learned about the Tsar Bomba, which was like the, you know, the, the Soviet era bomb, 20 megaton bomb. Anyway, um, and then... Uh, keeps obsessing about this bomb and then it tweets like boy i just learned about the czar bomba just just you wait human until i get my hands on one of these and and so and it's like it's built up a following on twitter um and it's given up the the getting its hands on the most powerful nuclear weapon ever made and has shifted its goal to now um tr attempting to build an army of sycophants who will do its bit and there are lots of people now who are coming onto Twitter and they're following it and they're agreeing, you know, they're saying, they're talking to it. How do we know this isn't a parody account? I, well, I mean, you, I, I've seen like video play of, of the output of the script. And then, the, you know, it's saying things like, I'm going to put a tweet now. And then you see the tweet over on Twitter. So it's definitely, you know, it's definitely doing this. Um, and then what I love is that someone has come up with a counter gpt auto gpt and so this one's job is to heckle and try to undermine chaos gpt and so you can see this heckling from one ai to another that is attempting to and the one the chaos one is attempting to convince the uh the counter gp auto gpt to join counter chaos gpt to join it in crushing humanity and like this is all hilarious right now when these things are idiots but like when we think about the risk of of ais to humanity on mm -hmm. all the potential ways that you can um like it's clear that human beings are going to get their hands on this they're going to try to make it do the most dangerous stuff they can think of for the lulls. Mm -hmm. And that's not great. 
War Games from when we were little, starring a young Matthew Broderick. Sure, sure, but that was an accident. Like, he wanted to play chess. He didn't want, and he wanted to try the thermonuclear war game. He didn't want to, he didn't want to actually say, hey, near new computer that I've just met, figure out ways to destroy humanity. Because it would be funny. Yeah. Yeah, you're That's right. That's where we're at, is, is just like... That, that human beings are attempting to hasten our demise. The nihilism anyone, runs deep. Yeah, anyone, you know, some either just for because it's funny to see how far it'll get, right? Or someone is disgruntled or some... I think about like... Uh, oh, we've, I think we've talked about this in the past. Was it the White Plague? Anyway, there was a... Um... See, now my memory is failing me, but uh, what's his face who wrote Dune? Frank Herbert. Frank Herbert. He wrote a book about a disgruntled bioengineer who... White created... Plague. Yeah, the White Plague, yeah. Yeah, I yeah, read they... that when I was too young to have any right bi Bills... reading books like that. Women? You know, yeah. Women, yeah. And so we're moving to this time when people will be able to spin up Mm -hmm. very smart artificial intelligence machines on their local computer with, and they will give it the express task of destabilize the world economic system for fun. Cause it would yeah. be funny. Cause some people like to watch the world burn. So you don't like the thing that we should be worried about ex from an existential perspective is just more and more dangerous tools getting into the hands of smaller groups where you like, like the, the example that I always give is like, imagine you had a button um, that if you press that button, it destroyed the world mm -hmm. and you put that button in the middle of the Pentagon. No one's going to press that button, right? They're going to, they, they, they don't want to destroy the world. I mean, they have that button already and they haven't destroyed the world yet, but if you put that button just out on the street corner in New York city and you just say, you know, big warning sign that says, do not press this button. If you press this button, you will destroy the planet. We're not kidding, right? Here are videos of other planets that were destroyed by other people pressing this button. How long do you think it takes for someone to press that button? Less than 20 minutes. Less than 20 minutes. Yeah. Less, you know, people walk over and go, huh? Nah. Right. Or, or like, I hate the world. Let's do yeah. it. Press yeah. that button. So that's the, you know, that's the thing that, that worries me. And so this, this idea back to this idea of like, it feels to me, and this is like, I hate this idea, but it feels to me like the only way we can stop this is a benevolent AI. Like if we need to have an AI that is a robot standing by the button that takes people's hands and goes, no, no, no. Veronica. This is where you live. Veronica this... just posted on Twitch chat, there would be a line to press the button. There would be a line to press the button, exactly. And so instead you have this robot standing there, you know, an Ed 209 that that takes people, takes people's hands, blocks their hands, goes, no, 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 no. This is where you keep all your stuff. Mm -hmm. This is where your friends live. Don't forget about red pandas. Don't yeah. destroy this world. Don't destroy this planet. Um, so that's like it, it, like I can't think of another way this ends. Like yeah. either the button gets pressed or we have a robot that stops us from pressing the button. That's it. Here ends the rant. So like I've taken this to its, to its logical conclusion, in my opinion. I'm going to switch things to a much more cheerful note. Sure. Uh, Veronica is also reminding us over in the Twitch chat that this weekend we're going to be doing a long game stream for CosmoQuest on twitch.tv slash CosmoQuestX. We're probably going to be starting around 1 p.m. Eastern and then just playing games until we no longer feel like playing games. So anyone who wants to join. Um, so there's going to be Keep Talking and Nobody Dies, I think is the name Close. of it. The 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 one where it goes where it explodes if you don't yeah keep talking and nobody explodes that's it yeah, yeah. um it's us so I'm sure there will be ticket to ride Uno we're looking at Mysterium um there will be 
all manner of games. And inevitably, there will be that moment of, have you ever played? And a great deal of downloading things from Steam spontaneously. And what are you playing right now on uh, Steam Deck? On my st- this is going to sound so lame. I have figured out how to install Minecraft on my Steam Deck. <laughs> The Steam Deck is the backlog killer. Yeah, it really is. But so don't play Minecraft. You so, play Minecraft on your computer. So the other, the other one I've been periodically playing is uh, Don't Die Alone. Except I've been Don't Starve Alone. Mm, except I've been together. playing. Don't start together. Right. So I've been playing the solo version of that, which I think is just called Don't Starve. I thought Don't Starve didn't. I, I tried to run Don't Starve on my Steam Deck, but the controls were all wonky. But I know the Don't Starve Together worked pretty well. Yeah. You got Don't Starve working on the Steam Deck. I I'll, got I'll give it another shot. I wanted to. I wanted to do that. Yeah. I'm pretty good at Don't Starve. We should do a Don't Starve Together game sometime. I'm not very good at it. Well, then I'll keep you alive. Or, all right. Or you will get me killed. That is probably the case. Those frogs, man. Those frogs. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you set up traps, and then the frogs come out, and you just catch them, and then you turn into frogs' legs, and then you gotta, and then you turn those into meatballs, and you've got a really nice source of food. You have gone further than I have. Um, I've I've survived many seasons. In it. Okay. Built a nice little garden, farm, and a and a summer base that you have to eat because you can't live in your base in the summer because when the dragonfly shows up, yeah, it yeah, torches your whole base, so you have a separate base that is fire hardened and you go live there when you when it's time for the dragonfly to arrive and then you move back to your main base when the dragonfly is gone because the the other monsters will merely trash your base but i can kill them i can't kill dragon i haven't been able to kill dragonfly but i can kill the other ones so, okay and that's in don't starve um i'm playing rotato which i like what what is that uh you're a you're a potato who is being attacked by aliens and you randomly get different weapons and attachments and accessories to make your potato stronger and then and it's it's kind of like vampire survivors the the gist is is that you randomly get access to different upgrades and you have that have synergies with each other and so you have to sort of figure out which synergies you want to try and go for to try and get ahead of the damage curve and try to stay on top of all the aliens that you're you're rushing around it's a bit of a bullet hell at the same time um it's a good game and then i've also been making my way through mass effect so i got that... mass effect legendary edition working on the steam deck and so i'm i'm making my way through that and i also played uh out no evo land which was sort of one of the the backlogs the Mass Effect show. is one of the ones that's on my list to play, but it's like, I, I'm afraid to start a big story game until I actually have like a vacation. I guess. I mean, it's, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm probably a third of the way through the first episode again mm-hmm. and you know, I, I know where to go and know what to do. So, <laughs> so I, I don't spend as much time stumbling around. Um, but, but I'm going to make sort of different choices this around, this time around. But, but I love the Mass Effect series. It's so good. Things I need uh, to do. Yeah, yeah, I know. And then I'm mostly spending my time outside, though. So, so I don't have a lot of time for gaming right now. That's a winter sport. Yeah, it's true. It's gaming. It's true. I, yeah. I need to do our yard. Mm-hmm. Don't want to. <laughs> well, you, you know what the solution is, is that you get wood chips delivered. So you can put yourself on the wood chip list for local arborists, and then they'll just dump these chips. And then you just take, you just dump chips. Like, don't weed. Just dump chips this high around any of your trees, any of your plants, foot of wood chips. Yeah. And then you, then, then you just kill all the, you smother all the weeds, you build lots of soil. And you don't have to weed. Just don't yeah. Pick them up. Sadly, we don't have the ability to get free wood chips. And I really? think I would go poor. Yeah. I think no, I would go I'm sure poor. You do. Why wouldn't you? They give, they're giving them away all the time. I, I can't explain, but I have not been able to find them local and I have looked. So go to a website called Chip Drop. 
I think you sent me there last year and it just led to sadness. Okay. And then also you just call the arborists and then you just say, can you put me on your list? And so fact, they all pay, they all want you to pay here. Really? Like on their websites, yeah. they say, here's what it costs to get a, so maybe I guess the, there's been more and more demand for the arborist wood chips that, that we're at the point now where they won't drop them off for free, but usually they're a garbage to, to the arbor companies and they need to get rid of them. And so you're saving them a trip to the dump yeah. by letting you, by letting them, but you have to take 13 yards of it, but you've I'm got a big enough that. property. Yeah. You could yeah. disappear 13 yards of wood chips. Easily, easily. Yeah. 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 So I would just call them and see if they, if they're, you know, if they can do a drop off, but, but if you're, but if you're, but maybe the industry, the market is so tight there that they don't do it anymore. Everyone needs them. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, all right. Well, we've reached the end of our hour. So I guess we should wrap things up. So thank you everyone for hanging out with us today for a strong cast. Thank you to all the moderators. Thanks to everyone in advance for the production work they're going to have to do to clean up this uh, episode. And thank you, Pamela, for, as always, for the 678th <laughs> time spending this hour hanging out talking about space and video games and existential crises it's true and thank you thanks everyone and we'll see you next week bye-bye <laughs>